right? Uh, yeah, so, um, so my name is uh, Mark DaCosta. Um, I'm the, the co-founder and chairman of Enigma, and uh, super interested in data, really excited to talk to you about it today, and, and sometimes I, uh, you can see me around the city with a really large antenna listening in on some of the ambient data that's uh, floating around uh, the airwaves. Um, so a little bit of background on Enigma. Uh, we are um, a sort of a growth stage company based here in New York. Uh, Founded in uh, 2011, about 100 people up in the Flatiron neighborhood. Um, have a bunch of uh, really wonderful investors that we've been uh, pleased to work with, and um, uh, some also great clients, largely in the financial services and pharmaceutical space. Um, just to give you a bit of kind of context on us, um, our mission is to really empower people to interpret and improve the world around them. So not just to uh, to try to understand it, but to in fact change it. Um, and we do that by trying to be uh, one of the core definitive sources of data about real world entities and things. Um, and kind of at the root of it, the way that we go about um, trying to accomplish that is by, by focusing on linking together external and internal sources of data uh, so that they can be utilized in people's uh, decision making processes and workflows. Um, this is a uh, sort of little bit of an overview of, of some of the four kind of areas that I'll be talking about today. Um, but the, the pillars that, that sort of really inform the work that we do around connecting data and applying it for um, better intelligence uh, has a couple of different verticals. So the first one, which I'll speak about much more in depth, is, is that of external data. So we do a lot of work with public data, things that governments publish, things that third parties aggregate and, and, uh, and uh, sort of focus on connecting all that together. Uh, the next piece is around internal data, so kind of an amazing uh, you know, context that I'm sure will be familiar to many of you is that in many large um, uh, organizations, data is sort of uh, scattered and uh, siloed and in, in sort of a difficult format to get talking to each other, so sort of focus on bringing all of that together. Uh, and we do that by uh, uh, sort of spending a lot of time on trying to understand how to link data, how to model it, what the semantics are. And then lastly, understanding how that can get applied uh, in workflows. Now, as I mentioned, we really, as a company, got our start in public data. So we spent over five years collecting over 100,000 different data sources from all over the world, mostly US, but this is you know, federal government, state government, local government, and a plurality of other sources. Um, and the reason that we really like public data, you know, I think, is, is sort of especially special is because it gives us this purview into things that are happening in the world outside of organizations. You know, in many respects, you can think about public data as this exhaust that happens every time that you touch uh, kind of government or regulation, and, and consequently, it paints this sort of picture in some ways of uh, economic activity, not necessarily in the way that you might find uh, it on Facebook or Google as reflected through clicks and links uh, and that, but rather when people are actually doing kind of brute material things in the world. Um, and you know, we think that there's, there's a lot about public data that still remains quite under the radar. There's you know, massive sources of trapped intelligence in this data that, uh, owing to the fact that it's scattered and unlinked and messy, uh, is often not used. Um, and then importantly, it does provide a, a foundation layer of context against which to understand uh, the work that um, organizations are doing. So it's, it's kind of extraordinary. I think that you know, we know that sure, the government collects all this data, there's all this stuff sort of going on, but I think oftentimes it's difficult to really appreciate kind of the full breadth and variety and scale of that. So each year in the United States, uh, people spend over 11 billion hours filling out forms, and this is just forms produced by the United States government. And the reason I know that, and this is one of my all-time favorite data sets, is because of this law that was passed in 1980 called the Paperwork Reduction Act. And what the Paperwork Reduction Act basically requires is any time that the federal government wants to uh, create a new form to collect information from people or companies or whatever it might be, they themselves have to fill out a form. And one of the things that they have to measure is uh, how many of these forms are going to be produced and how many hours do they expect uh, it, it will be a burden to the public to fill them out. So this, I'm sure, is a familiar form to many people in this room. It's just a 
1040 tax return. And I don't know if, if you've ever noticed, but kind of highlighted up here uh, in the corner is this OMB number. So all of these forms get registered with the Office of Management and Budget, which is part of the executive branch, and they're given a little serial number. So it's kind of extraordinary because you can actually start to back out and see you know, what is the full breadth of, these, of this data that's collected. So of course, this is one of the most collected forms in the country, customs form, if you come into the country. There are over 300 million of those filled out a year. Uh, W-2s, maybe not a big surprise, you have 250 million of those. Um, I was kind of surprised to see that there are actually 87 million uh, what are called friction ridge cards, or these fingerprint cards that wind up getting bubbled up to the federal government each year. Uh, there's of course a massive problem with the criminal justice system in this country, but additionally these become relevant for a lot of different permitting processes. So I think this one uh, is for a pyrotechnic operator, so that stuff that just bubbles up to the FBI or some other agency. Um, and the, the long tail of this stuff gets actually pretty incredible. So it runs the gamut from, I think there's 10 or 15 people every year that fill out this form for fishermen who are fishing in the Russian waters between Alaska and, and Russia. Um, you know, coal mine dust sampling devices and, and all sorts of number, number of other things. And so while not all of this data uh, is made available to the public, it is collected, and, and what we're really interested in is this vast amount of data that is made public and how it can help us better understand the world. So this stuff you know, also runs kind of the gamut. So this is like a Federal Election Commission uh, regulatory filing from the Trump campaign, and you can see this is you know, a line item of $140 spent once on an Uber ride. Um, is of course a McDonald's drive-through, and you might ask yourself, what, might, what does this have to do with uh, government data? But it's actually very interesting. The Federal Communication Commission in the United States issues about 30 million licenses to broadcast on the radio spectrum. And this is everything from cell phone towers and you know, FM radio, all the way down to commercial radios. And as it turns out, every McDonald's drive-through uh, in the country is connected uh, from the drive-through to the store using one of these commercial radios. So if you look at the FCC data, you can find the 25,000 or so McDonald's drive-throughs that exist in the country. Um, and the list you know, here really goes on. This is a um, uh, sort of a not-for-profit uh, schedule where you can see the very impressive salaries that people at the Museum of Modern Art get paid. Um, every state has an elevator database, so you can actually see every elevator in the state. If you were uh, going up for a McKinsey interview or something like that, you could imagine summing the you know, total number of pounds that the elevators in the state could carry or the aggregate speed, but it is quite incredible to see this level of resolution. Um, you know, real estate, of course, is a big one. This is, it was just kind of fun. I looked up this building and there was a recent $30 million mortgage taken against it. I'm imagining for some of that construction in the back. Um, aircraft ownership, which I'll talk a bit more about in a second. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite pieces of kind of public government data. It's a customs document that was filed in 1969. Uh, by the uh, sort of captain of the Apollo 11 mission when they came back from the moon. And because they were importing rocks from the moon into the United States, they had to fill their corn out, and here it is. <laughs> and so I think, you know, all of this really speaks to the fact that there is a massive and heterogeneous amount of information that is, uh, in some ways, available out there in the public record. But of course, it's, you know, it's not as simple as all of that because this data is you know, not only really hard to get at, but in, in some instances, but once you do get at it, uh, it is uh, tremendously difficult to work with and very messy. And you know, there's a bunch of different issues that start to arise when you sort of take this data and want to put it together into a view of the world. So of course, you know, one of the, the biggest issues is around data quality and um, uh, even just you know getting the files to sort of load properly and, uh, and things of this nature, but then there are these um, you know additional concerns around how do you get all of these disparate data sets talking to each other? You know, there's a great example from New York City where this building that we're in, of course, there's data about it that the tax department has, that the fire department has, um, you know, the police department has, all of these different folks but each of them have a different way of referring to this building. So the, you know, the post office might want to know, okay, you know, Moore Street, where is the mailbox in the front? Uh, the tax department doesn't think about it necessarily as an address. They think about it in terms of a borough block and lot identifier. 
uh, Con Ed and utility companies are more concerned with latitudes and longitudes and shape files of uh, where their distribution infrastructure is. And so whenever you're bringing together a vast amount of data, this of course becomes a really big challenge of how do you scale getting this stuff to talk to each other. Um, you know, certainly the trying to take synoptic points of view on this data uh, is very challenging also because of the way that data is produced and where it lives in the real world. So just to give you an example, things like those elevator inspections or things like liquor licenses or real estate tax assessments are all produced locally. So I think we have data from 46 or 47 states around liquor licenses. So this requires uh, us to have a, an infrastructure where we can uh, basically and oftentimes have people call them, request CDs and have sort of the the kind of uh, ground game in place to get all of that stuff coming in and integrated. Um, and, you know, kind of at root, really the challenge that, you know, we are trying to solve and that I think offers a lot of promise as a general way of thinking is taking these rows and columns of data that come from these government sources and turning them into things and connections. Because once they're, once you can think about them and query them and analyze them as things, then you can actually start to learn things much more quickly about the real world. Um, I won't go into too much detail right now on sort of the, the kind of technical process through which we do that, but I'd be happy to entertain questions later. But effectively, you know, we go through a couple of different steps of, of moving from raw data to kind of things and connections. Um, you know, the first piece is needing to be able to kind of classify and understand what data is. Um, you know, is this, uh, does this look like a company name or does it look like a person's name? Does, you know, in, in a GDPR context, does this look like a, a Swiss person or a, you know, a South African person or whatever the case might be? Um, then once you kind of understand what data is, there's a lot of challenges around figuring out how things connect and how that maps onto a way of representing and modeling the world. And I'll speak much more in a moment about sort of how we think about ontology and, and connecting this data together. Um, but then from there, there's, you know, it's sort of an extended process of you know, normalizing, you know, things like names and addresses and getting everything in a common frame and then making it available for uh, insertion into workflows so that this data can actually be used to drive decision making. Um, so I, uh, by training as an undergrad, I studied philosophy. So I learned a lot about ontology in this, in this kind of very theoretical and abstract context. And of course, in the philosophical world, ontology is kind of these questions of, you know, what is a thing, what is being, how does it all sort of connect together? Um, and I was really delighted uh, when I learned that this was also sort of a major concern of folks in computer science and in the sort of the database design community. Um, and of course, in, in the sort of computer science world, uh, ontology largely refers to the way that you uh, map together connections and things in your data to represent some kind of real world thing that you're interested in. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, of course sort of something that once the mid 90s, once the internet sort of started taking off, um, we had a proliferation of people making databases and, and engineers and schemas and things, and consequently, then the sort of required uh, Google ngram graph, we can see that the usage of this term has become sort of an ever increasing thing that people are concerned with. And, you know, sort of at its route, when, or at its root, when we think about connected data and we think about modeling data, um, we think uh, largely in terms of, of what are called triples. Um, <clears throat> and so triples are a basic sort of unit in, in sort of trying to think about how to connect data together where you basically have three parts. You have uh, a subject, a predicate, and kind of a verb in the middle. So here you can see uh, we have this uh, sort of at the top, this uh, one, two, three, four is a person. So we have this idea of something that is a person, and we define that as something that has different attributes. It has a first name, it has a last name, it has an age. Um, then we define a kind of connection or this sort of verb idea. So this person lives in a location. You can imagine many different kinds of verbs. You could imagine is married to, you know, was born in, whatever the, the sort of relationship is that you want to cue into. Um, and then lastly, in this kind of triple, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, visualize this in a moment, we have another thing uh, that we call a location that also has attached to it a bunch of different attributes like addresses and zip codes and so on. 
Um, and you can sort of imagine this way of representing data uh, being uh, visualized in kind of a graphical way that uh, kind of enables you to see the nature of these sorts of connections. Um, so here we have in, on the left our, our person entity type that has these attributes whose inner relationship lives in this location. Um, and one of the things that is extremely kind of interesting and tricky when you're thinking about connecting data together to solve um, different kinds of analytic, analytics problems at scale is the way in which you kind of define what your things are and what your uh, relationships are. Because these enable you to ask certain kinds of questions and to view the world in specific kinds of ways. So this is an example, is a kind of you know, ontology or schema that's used for um, corruption and money laundering investigations. So if you think about, you know, if you're a journalist or if you are a, uh, you know, someone working in, in law enforcement or in a bank and you're trying to understand, uh, um, you know, how do I sort of take a vast amount of data and sort of only filter it out in such a way where I'll be able to ask questions about things like kleptocracy or, you know, state-sponsored corruption or whatever. This is a very specific way of looking at the world and it, it requires you to structure it accordingly. So if that's the, the kind of problem domain that you're working in, then you're going to want to think about things like, uh, you know, contracts and public bodies and companies and payments and aircrafts and ships and these sorts of things that, you know, when you actually understand what is the problem set around, um, you know, money laundering or human trafficking or whatever, you understand that these are the kinds of things that you need to be backfilling for and the way that you're going to be best suited to, to sort of see the world. And just to kind of, you know, kind of give you an example of the kinds of, of questions, just kind of concretize this a little bit that you can ask. You know, imagine that uh, you wanted to know uh, where all the headquarters of companies um, were with founders that were born in Cleveland. So you can imagine, this is a very simple example, but you can imagine you're pulling together these four or five different data sets that all have kind of a piece of the puzzle. Um, and uh, you want to bring those into a common frame. So you can imagine you have information about founders, you have information about uh, you know, was born in, information about companies who have founders, and you can kind of represent it in, in this graphical way that enables the connections to kind of come to the fore. But what's nice about putting it in this graphical database is it enables you to uh, start to ask these multi-hop sort of questions to find the companies of founders who were born in uh, Cleveland. And so then, of course, uh, you can kind of query it and, and surface an answer. But you might be wondering, you know, sort of, uh, why, why would you need to do it in this way? I mean, you just showed me a couple of tables and they have a common identifier and, you know, maybe if you're thinking in terms of, uh, you know, traditional databases and say, hey, why can't we just write a SQL query or something and join all those keys together and get the answer? Um, and of course, uh, in this simple context, the answer is you could, but the problem is that when you're trying to deal with a, a massive amount of data, you know, pulling information from tens or hundreds of thousands of different data sources, you have the issue that um, you know, for any one of these companies or founders or whatever it might be, information could be scattered across all of these tables. And so if you're sort of sitting there and trying to kind of write a SQL query each time you want to ask something, you run into this problem because, because of the kind of dispersion of all of this information. But even more than that, um, you start to run into problems around uh, disambiguating these entities. and from a uh, kind of a workflow perspective, you want to be set up so that um, you can build a graph that has all of these entities and links in them, and then uh, sort of use this as something that's going to really increase your velocity and ability to find uh, insight and connections between all these things. And certainly by having a structure like this in place, it provides a common frame to continue to add additional and incremental data uh, on top of it. Um, just as a kind of quick summary, and then I'm going to jump into some very kind of specific examples about all this, but we use this sort of approach um, for a vast variety of use cases uh, in the enterprise context. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, we do a lot of work uh, with folks in, in kind of the financial services and, and life sciences space, and so we found kind of tremendous applicability for this, these sorts of techniques and things like uh, anti-money laundering investigations. So 
you know, banks, of course, are required to make sure that they, uh, you know, know who they're doing business with and aren't uh, facilitating you know, any kind of malfeasance or whatever. And they face a massive challenge because inside of you know, most large financial institutions, all of the information that they have about their customers uh, is scattered across you know, what could be dozens of different data sets just internally. Um, and you know, in addition to that, they need to basically not only know what they know about the, these customers, but to actually be able to um, you know, check and see, are these folks on you know, maybe sanctions lists or you know, uh, is a company that this person is a director of also a company that's maybe been sanctioned for something or being able to develop this much broader understanding of who customers are. So having these points of connections become uh, extremely important. And certainly, uh, you know, as another example here, uh, in uh, life sciences becomes a really big issue. So we do a lot of work in a field called pharmacovigilance. So this basically refers to a uh, drug company's responsibility to make sure that when there are adverse event reports or bad things that happen with drugs that are out in the market, they need to be able to account for uh, the scale of that and why it may have happened. And if you think about uh, from the time that a barrel of chemicals comes into a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant to the time that a bottle of pills shows up in a Duane Reed or whatever it might be, this travels through hundreds if not thousands of different databases and there's a tremendous amount of challenge of building this kind of comprehensive uh, view of things. Um, but to kind of move uh, from maybe the, a little bit of the theoretical part of this uh, conversation into something a bit more concrete, I'd love to um, sort of spend this, the second half of this talk digging into some really specific examples and kind of showcasing uh, how all these pieces come together. And could I have a time check? Um, uh, Great. Um, so, uh, so three basic kind of buckets of things I want to talk about. One is uh, this kind of sensor-driven investigation that's focused on kind of understanding uh, government surveillance, a very kind of fun, interesting case study. Uh, another one is about taking public and proprietary data to develop uh, new levels of insight into communities and real estate and sort of what's happening in really local geographic areas. And uh, lastly, using public data for um, uh, for public safety. So uh, the first one, this isn't an uh, a, a investigation we did, um, but it, it was done by some journalists at BuzzFeed, but I think it's an absolutely wonderful story and is really illustrative of a lot of uh, the points here. So just curious, th does anyone here know what a, a stingray or an MC catcher is? Great, so I see some hands. So uh, basically this is kind of a, a diagram of the way they work, but basically what it is, you know, you have a cell phone, uh, and your cell phone is constantly looking for cell towers to connect to, and often it can find many. Uh, and what your phone does is it selects the one with the best signal and connects to that one. Um, what stingrays do is they pretend to be cell phone towers, and uh, they're generally sort of uh, much closer to you than the real cell phone towers. And so your phone sees them and says, oh great, here's a really strong tower, I'm going to connect to it. So your phone connects to one of these stingrays, um, and then that stingray connects to the phone tower, so you can still make calls and do all of these things, but it gives the person with the stingray uh, kind of a, a privileged position in the middle of this network, and so they can use it uh, to sort of track people and understand um, their activities. And as it works out, uh, when these are used by law enforcement and other actors, uh, they're very often put in airplanes and then sort of flown around cities and around the border and things like that. Uh, now, airplanes are kind of amazing for lots of reasons, uh, but one, uh, one in particular is that they're kind of, they, they spew off like uh, an immense amount of data exhaust in addition to all of the carbon. And um, one of the things that's really interesting is they have these uh, radios on them called, AD, uh, called ADSB radios. These broadcast at like 1090 megahertz. And basically, they just are continuously announcing, hey, I'm in this plane, here's where I'm going, here's my tail number, and all of that. Um, super incredible. If you guys are ever interested in this stuff, for 20 bucks, you can buy a radio that will let you listen uh, to the planes above. And if you have a map, you can download a free piece of software and then immediately be visualizing all the planes above you. But what these journalists at BuzzFeed did is they sort of understood that there was some level of use of these surveillance technologies by uh, police and law enforcement, and they wanted to understand the kind of scale of it. Uh, 
So they went to a public data set. This is the Federal Aviation Administration plane registry. I think there's about 300,000 planes registered in the US. And they looked for all of the ones that um, you know, were registered to, let's say, Homeland Security or something like that. So they found a bunch of tail numbers and said, OK, these are some known planes. And then they went to a sort of a private uh, commercial source of this uh, airplane position data. Uh, of Flight Radar 24. Maybe some of you guys have seen this web page when you're trying to track flights of relatives coming in or whatever. And they started looking through these planes. And uh, what they found was, yeah, look, there are some of these um, uh, sort of yeah, Homeland Security planes that are coming around and flying in these circles, uh, which is the pattern kind of indicative of um, a sort of tracking a, uh, a person or a car or whatever it might be. And so they sort of through this way wrote like a first story and kind of had uncovered, you know, dozens of these planes um, even happened to use, being used by local law enforcement that were sort of not being reported to the public and that there was a general amount of obscurity around. But interestingly, what they did next was say, okay, we found these planes that kind of are clearly um, uh, registered to, you know, certain governmental agencies. But what are the other planes that might be out there? Are there other sort of actors or um, agents that are doing this sort of thing? So they did something really interesting. Because they were able to get all of this kind of uh, flight path history data uh, from uh, this uh, provider, but you could also collect it yourself, um, they built a, a classifier. And basically what they said is, we've identified all of these planes that we know are flying in these kind of very unusual <laughs> patterns. Let's try to join that with all of this kind of historical data that we have to see if we can uncover any new patterns. Um, and uh, yeah, so then they, they said, yeah, look, there is all of this sort of other kind of flight patterns that are uh, exhibiting these, these kinds of characteristics. And what was kind of incredible is through this, they were able to uncover dozens of other companies um, that as they dug further into, they discovered were um, eff effectively uh, sort of front companies for um, different government agencies that were sort of using these things in a way that uh, you know, there wasn't much public uh, accountability around. And I think this is kind of a fascinating example of thinking about taking um, you know, two, kind of, you know, two sort of quasi-public data sets uh, and thinking about you know, new ways of finding uh, an ability to kind of join on identifiers that are either there or implicit in them to reveal things that previously were um, totally obscure and invisible. Um, and so just to kind of uh, uh, bracket that for a moment, um, I want to shift over and talk about another example that's sort of really focused on thinking about what is it that, govern that sort of public data and other forms of data can tell us about local communities. Um, you know, when you think about, of course, some of the examples that have been discussed today, you could probably start to imagine, and I'm sure through your own work, how much um, insight is potentially there. Um, from our perspective, we see a really broad range of things, um, you know, thinking about everything from uh, looking at building permits to even uh, FDIC bank deposits. So the FDIC can find every bank branch in the country and know uh, how cash balances change over time. Uh, you know, looking at 311 and 911 data, looking at uh, real estate tax assessments, etc. Um, you know, and of course, when you start to put all of this stuff together, um, you can develop sort of new levels of insight that become applicable for asking more complicated kind of questions about um, communities and how um, certain things might impact them. So, you know, if you want to understand something like how Amazon opening a new headquarters in a city might have an impact on local business and what directions that can drive having um, access to a, a more rich base layer of, of data really enables you to push those questions uh, much further. And to just kind of run through like a quick kind of for instance to kind of highlight like, you know, other metrics and ways of thinking about the comparisons between places. Um, this is sort of a juxtaposition of some indicators uh, in a five mile radius in between uh, Menlo Park and uh, Memphis, Tennessee. These are of course very different places. Um, uh, you know, order of magnitude uh, difference in terms of population, but you can start to think about asking what are other ways that we can start to understand the overlaps and kind of divergences of these places. So, you know, for instance, we look at things like, you know, how many banks, how many places of worship, uh, you know, are there uh, facilities that have um, sort of, that are regulated by the EPA for toxic release, 
inventories, you know, what, are, what is the scale of like, OSHA violations, um, daycare centers, you know, shipping centers, all of these sorts of things. And you can start to you know, really put places in context with each other in, in, uh, in new ways. So, uh, you know, as an example, uh, you know, Menlo Park has 26 times more banks per capita than Memphis. It's not so surprising, it's a pretty substantial scale. You know, 18x on daycare, 22x on fire stations per capita. Um, and these are sort of places that when you dig into a deeper granularity have, um, uh, you know, much, a much broader sort of divergence than maybe would be apparent at first blush. Um, this, of course, can be used for all sorts of different applications. Um, we see it uh, being used certainly to sort of prospect and identify um, you know, specific real estate parcels. I mean, I heard earlier even that there are some potential use cases going around sort of trying to think about um, you know, opportunity, how would you identify an opportunity sites for um, a potential solar installation and ways of scaling that more effectively. Um, we also see this being joined a lot with uh, internal data when you're talking about uh, large asset managers that have um, big real estate portfolios and trying to understand um, you know, trends and opportunities that, that emerge around that. Um, uh, can I have a time check? How are we doing? Um, sorry, I'm yeah. cool. um, That's great. So, so of course, this sort of uh, information has uh, applicability in the commercial space, um, but also. Uh, can be can be you know utilized I think in a lot of ways to drive um, uh, you know public impact in terms of public safety. Um, so this is I want to talk about a project that we worked on uh, a couple of years ago and have been sort of updating since uh, around uh, trying to effectively reduce the number of uh, deaths and injuries that happen uh, in the United States due to uh, to home fires. So it's very you know kind of. Uh, I think startling kind of scale, but this is still the case. The biggest things you can do to drive that number down is to install a smoke alarm. And I'd say if you have one takeaway from the talk today, you should check the batteries in your smoke alarm when you, <laughs> when you go home. Um, and you know, across the US, it's estimated that there's you know, well over 10 million homes that don't have smoke detectors in them. Um, unfortunately, you know, while this is sort of a long-standing problem, uh, it often takes a tragedy to actually focus um, public attention and, and, and mobilization around trying to address it. Um, we at Enigma um, have been sort of over the last few years working on this problem um, and it sort of first emerged uh, when there was a large fire that happened in, uh, in a neighborhood in New Orleans called Broadmoor where a bunch of people were killed and it, it sort of created a moment um, when people said, okay, you know, this is enough. We need to really try to do something about this, um, and you know it's interesting. Like you know, smoke detectors are super cheap. Three or four or five dollars, you can you can buy one. If anyone goes to a fire station and asks for a smoke detector, they more than likely have a bunch in the back and will give them to you. Um, but the challenge lies in the fact that you know of these 10, 12 million houses that don't have smoke detectors, it's often hard to identify where they are. And even though there are you know, volunteers that the Red Cross has and others who go and knock on doors and try to give these smoke detectors away and get them installed, they have very limited resources and there's a challenge of figuring out how do you prioritize uh, what is a very limited uh, sort of amount of, of potential outreach resource. And so what we did here uh, was try to think about how could we utilize and leverage different forms of public data to help come up with a risk model so that um, if, you know, if we only have bandwidth in a certain city to knock on 5,000 doors, let's make sure that we knock on the 5,000 doors that have the highest risk of not having a smoke detector in them. So in order to do this, we wanted to make sure that the workflow and the output of our analysis would be something that uh, would actually fit into pre-existing practices. So I think it's very important, and this is a, I think a trap that a lot of analytics projects sometimes suffer falling into, is that uh, to be successful in, in the sort of output of an analysis, you have to understand how is it actually going to be used and what are people on the ground actually doing. So in this case, we wanted to make sure that you know, the output wasn't necessarily like a fancy visualization or an iPad app, but rather a, a, just a list of addresses that if you have time to knock on a thousand doors, these are the thousand doors that you should knock on. 
One of the main um, kind of data sets that we used here uh, was, uh, this was kind of, I, I think, certainly maybe something of an interesting, if somewhat imperfect, but still quite predictive uh, join was trying to figure out a way to connect the American Housing Survey with the American Community Survey. So the American Housing Survey is really interesting because it tells us all sorts of things about how, you know, about how people live in their homes and how long they've been there, how many people live there, what the house is made out of, et cetera, et cetera. But that data is only re uh, reported at the level of a, a met like a city, effectively, a metropolitan statistical area. The American Community Survey, uh, by contrast, is extremely granular. It comes in these little uh, census blocks that could be a thousand or a few thousand people at most. And um, they give you a bunch of information about um, you know, what is the actual kind of demographic makeup and, and the people that are living in these homes. What's interesting is we found that there are about 100 or 150 questions in both of these surveys that were basically asking the same thing, but in different, uh, in different language. So we made a, basically a mapping in between uh, these two data sets for these questions that were identified to be um, uh, basically the same, and used this to train a, a classifier model to see what are the, the attributes of these homes and of these communities that are predictive of houses not having a smoke detector. Now what was great about this was the American Housing Survey actually asked as a question, do you have a smoke detector? So there was some base level of information here, but because it was only reported at the citywide level, we had to do work to kind of project it down uh, onto the, the block level. And so in doing this, uh, we found um, a bunch of variables that I think in aggregate um, were you know, more than 60% accurate in uh, identifying uh, houses that didn't have smoke detectors and used this um, to effectively uh, develop this uh, risk scored model of all of the blocks in a city. And to go from uh, the blocks in the city that we now have this kind of high level risk score on to actual actionable sets of addresses, um, we made the, sort of an open source uh, workflow around getting the Tiger data set uh, up and running, which is the, the kind of geocoding data set that the US Census uh, provides and is useful as a free geocoder uh, once you uh, get rid of the difficulties of um, standing it up and making it uh, useful. Um, and so uh, if this is something you're interested in, we have it, it's called Smoke Signals. It's up at uh, labs.enigma.com slash smoke signals. And uh, it's been super encouraging. We've been working with, um, as I mentioned, the cities in, in New Orleans and Buffalo and elsewhere. And uh, it's been uh, quite impactful in, in some of those places. Um, so I think to, to kind of maybe leave things there and close up, um, what I you know, sort of I hope you guys take away from this and what I would sort of like to communicate is you know, thinking of like really in, in your sort of individual work and, and projects that you uh, take on, really thinking about how can I sort of approach problems uh, that really takes into account the, the breadth of data from maybe unexpected sources uh, that, that speak to the problem at hand and what are the opportunities for connecting it and digging deeper. Uh, and so with that, I'll thank you very much.